Welcome back, everyone. And today we will be continuing our exploration of chapter four on sensation and perception. Last class, we talked about vision, and today we'll talk about um, some other sensory faculties, hearing and um, olfaction, taste, and uh, your body's uh, sense of, of, of awareness of self, like proprioception, balance, that sort of thing. So the remaining senses. Hearing is the sense that we rely on most after sight. And, and that, of course, refers to able-bodied people because there, there are people who are deaf and they don't rely on their hearing. They would, they would rely perhaps even more on their sight because they speak a, a visual language. Hearing refers to the sensation. Well, it's the perception of, of sound waves, okay? So sound waves are, are vibrations of molecules through, through the air. Sound waves can also travel through water. It sounds a little different. It can also travel through walls, but it has to travel through something as a vibration. You, can't, you couldn't hear in, in a vacuum. So last class, we talked about light waves and how the brightness of a color or a stimulus um, is associated with the amplitude of, of the light waves that are being reflected at us from that object. Same principle applies to hearing. The loudness of a sound relates back to the amplitude of the sound wave. Then there are some, some other properties. Pitch refers to, um, to wavelength. Okay, that's kind of like like hue was was with color, and high pitch tones are have high frequencies, and lower pitch tones have um, lower frequencies. I have a a high pitched voice. It always surprises me to hear my voice on on a recording. It sounds lower in my head, and then I hear myself like whoa. Um, Having a lower pitched voice conveys dominance. And if you want to have more authority in an interaction, one thing you can do, this has been empirically tested, is uh, drop the pitch of your voice. And of course, uh, men have, have lower pitched voices than women. And so one thing that, that women can do, I mean, I should say people of the female sex really, um, can do to lower their pitch is actually go into the vocal fry range. This is vocal fry. It sounds very, it sounds unimpressed and and serious. And, and it says, I mean business, right? It's not being sort of sweet and nice and, and agreeable. So if you're a person of the female sex, you can throw some, some fry into your voice when, um, when it's time to be really serious with, with somebody. All right. Remember when we talked about color, we talked about hue, which was the wavelength. And then we also talked about saturation. A color can be pure or can be kind of muddier. Same thing happens with sound, and we call that timbre. I know it looks like it's pronounced timber, but I believe it's actually pronounced timbre. And, and that refers to, to the complexity of the sound. And different instruments have, have different timbres. And, and that accounts for, for the complexity of, of music. So the ear, as you know, is the key organ involved in sound processing. And it has three main parts. What you can see here on the side of my head is the outer ear. And this cartilage is shaped in such a way that it helps funnel the sound waves into the ear. And then there's the, the middle ear. And the middle ear refers to these bones called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, which pick up the sound waves and transmit them to the inner ear, 
which is the place where that vibration gets transduced, gets converted into the neural activity. In, uh, someone's got their microphone on. And I hear some background noise. Let me just handle that. There we go. Okay. So the inside the inner ear, you'll find the, the organ of corti and the basilar membrane. And we'll talk about those soon. So how do we perceive pitch? We do that in, in a couple of different ways. Just like with, remember with um, color vision, you had two different theories and they were, they were both right. It's like that with pitch perception again. So the frequency theory of hearing proposes that whatever the pitch of a sound wave, um, nerve impulses of a corresponding frequency will be sent to the auditory nerve. So a tone measuring 600 hertz would be transduced into 600 nerve impulses a second. That theory works well for some sounds, but not for others, okay? It has a problem with high pitch sounds because the neurons can't fire fast enough. And then to, to reach the necessary output speed, what happens is the neurons work together in, the, in a, like a volley system in which different neurons fire in sequence. And then we can detect sounds up to about um, 4,000 Hertz. Then there's uh, place theory. So, so pitch is determined in part by, um, by the rate of firing, but then also there's also detection by the area of the cochlea that fires the most frequently. So that's place theory. It's about where it's being transduced. And according to that theory, there's, there's a specific location along the basilar membrane that matches a specific tone and pitch. And there's uh, another microphone on somewhere. Okay. And the higher frequency tones, um, <coughs> oh, I'm gonna, let me see. Can everyone please mute their microphones? I'm not sure where that background noise is coming from. I'm not seeing anything now. Okay. Maybe it's feedback from me. All right. Back to the lecture. So um, that uh, accounts. So the, the high frequency tones are, are picked up more at the base of the membrane. On to, to smell and taste. These are the chemical senses. The other senses that we talked about were about taking a, a, a wave of energy and transducing that into to neural into a nerve firing. And now the chemical senses are about a receptor that actually detects a chemical. And there's a specific receptor for a specific chemical. Uh, Although we think of them separately, smell and taste are actually very related. Um, and the perception of smell and taste even converges like in, in the orbital, orbitofrontal cortex. Okay, they're, they're processed together. 70 or 80% um, of taste is smell. Like if you lose your sense of smell, you'll also lose your taste. Um, if you give people things to taste where they can't feel the texture, right? They might not know what it is without the smell. Um, if you um, have somebody smell something and, and they also can't, can't see it or feel it or see a picture of it, they probably won't know what it is, okay? Um, so a, a strategy, if you don't like the taste of something you have to eat is, is to just hold, hold your nose. So the parts of the brain that are associated with smell and taste are more primitive, like it's a, a very important primal kind of sense. Think of 
think of your your dog's behavior when when you go for a walk with your dog. They spend a, a lot of time sniffing. Okay. So it's interesting how the the olfactory and the gustatory cortices are in the midbrain. Okay, isn't that interesting? Right? They're they're not part of the somatosensory cortex, right? In in the forebrain, they're they're in the midbrain, and and it's what you'd expect for these you know very primitive senses that that are connected to primal drives, and and survival behavior. So. Um, these senses work together um, to en enhance your liking or disliking of, of some foods. And, and basically, we're adapted to like the taste of foods that are good for us and not like the taste of food that are bad for us. So um, a lot of people, especially um, people who are a bit more vulnerable, like children or pregnant people, don't, don't, like, um, don't like bitter tastes because those can, be, can indicate sort of spoiled food or very sour tastes. So odors are airborne chemicals, right? There's an odorant molecule in the air that's going up your nose and it interacts with receptors in the lining of the nasal passages. And each olfactory neuron has a single type of receptor and it recognizes the odorant based on its shape. It's that lock and key model similar to, to neurotransmitters. And um, interesting structure. Look at how um, look at how fragile that is. So you can see here there's the nasal cavity. Oh no, let me turn my my laser pointer on. There we go. Okay. So you can see the nasal ca cavity and um, there, there's a bone here. Okay, the cribriform plate between the brain and and the the these neurons that are sending there that are connected to the olfactory bulb. And so if you get a concussion, right, if your brain moves back and forth a little bit too much, it can shear off those connections. Right? And you can lose your sense of smell after a concussion. Similarly to the way that odorant receptors work in your nose, you have chemical receptors on your tongue. Okay? And those receptors are called taste buds. I can see, see the structure here. And the taste buds are distributed across your tongue and there are different taste buds for for different tastes but it's not true that you know that the front of your tongue can only taste sweet things and the sides of your tongue can only taste sour things that that was a myth that is something that i did learn when i was an intro intro psych though but it's so easily disproved because you can just put a bit of salt anywhere on your tongue and taste it and i see a question from ruby how do olfactory hallucinations work you know what i didn't even know that olfactory hallucinations were a thing I um anytime somebody says hallucination, I imagine a visual or an auditory hallucination. So excellent question. And and I don't know. I didn't even know people could have those. Uh, we are sensitive to five basic tastes, and those are sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Uh, I remember when it was four, and then then they added the umami, and and umami is like a a meaty kind of taste. Think of um, the taste of, you know, a lot of like like Japanese food. The taste of like natto and uh, sushi, and what's that? What's that delicious soup that's made out of miso soup? Okay, those are umami tastes, and what that actually corresponds to is is glutamate. Remember glutamate? That's a, a neurotransmitter, and it's one that we get like you can access it directly in food. And it's uh, glutamate is an excitatory. It's the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the body, and it um, 
you can add it to food to make it taste better. It's sold as monosodium glutamate. But interestingly, uh, monosodium glutamate only seems to work when it's combined with um, umami tasting foods. Like it, it doesn't, if you add it to, I mean, they, they, they add a lot of it to Chinese food. But if you add it to, say, like a dessert, it, it wouldn't make it taste better. Um, there's some evidence for, for a fatty taste. Um, and what they say in your textbook was about it was quite interesting that um, there, there were changes in, in people's, so was it the blood levels of fat that followed um, them, them tasting a fatty subject, a substance that suggested that this, one of the functions, the adaptive functions of the taste was to help your body prepare to metabolize it. Now, your textbook says that pheromones are odorless chemicals that serve as a social signal to members of the same species. I don't know that they are odorless. I believe they can, in fact, have odor. But that's the odor isn't the point. Like whether you could smell them or not, that's not how they work. Uh, pheromones are are very interesting because they're they're kind of like a, a hormone almost that's um, that that one person can can put into the air that someone else that goes into someone else's body and then affects their their response and and that's really fascinating okay so um, they're important. Um, very important for some animals' behaviors. Um, like if you've ever seen like insects kind of piling up on top of each other, like they're one of them is, or maybe even more than one of them is, is secreting a pheromone that's, that's drawing the other ones there. And it looks like that's, that's going to be a, a mating session. Um, and so it's, it's a fascinating kind of cross between like an odorant molecule and a hormone. Like that's, that's fascinating, I think. Anyway, there's different types of, of pheromone. Um, there are alarm pheromones, um, food trail pheromones, sex pheromones, and, and many others uh, that, that affect behavior or physiology. And I see a comment there about Axe body spray. And um, I, I, do, I do think that smells good, but um, I don't, that doesn't have pheromones in it. So, that's just a, maybe a, maybe it smells attractive. Um, maybe women like the smell of it. Uh, I think there was some research on it and it seems to make the men who are, are wearing it feel more confident. Uh, the question there, how important are pheromones for human interaction, for human attraction? Okay, well, we'll get into that. And um, the pheromones are picked up by an, an organ called the vomeronasal organ, and it is in in the na nasal cavity. And there's a picture of it there. It looks like a little sort of jelly blob. And um, in in humans, we 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 have it, but it's not as well developed as in other animals. Um, and I have a question there: Can smells trigger certain memories? Good or bad? Absolutely, yes. Um, and I think that there's an indication there for for an evidence based aromatherapy. Um, I think that complementary and alternative practices can be quite powerful if they're properly understood. Um, you know, aromatherapy is not going to uh, cure a disease. Like you're not going to cure someone's diabetes by ha by diffusing cinnamon oil, right? But they are powerfully connected to to memories and to emotion because that's that's your limbic system. Remember your, your limbic system, what does it do? It has to do with those, those primal drives with your, with your emotions. Um, and it has a lot to do with, with memory, especially kind of unconscious memory. So, and, and then it's connected to, to smell and, and to taste. So, so yes, absolutely. Smells can trigger memories and very powerfully even. Um, all right. So back to pheromones. And so there was a question there. How important are pheromones for human attraction? And there, there is some, some research on, on that subject. And they also, you know, you can, you can go buy them. So uh, here, this is liquid trust. And apparently, um, 
the, the people who purchase this, the are mostly salespeople. And so this this is a social pheromone that allegedly um, makes people trust you. So you can go uh, wear some of that next time you have to talk someone into something. Um, and, you know, I'm not aware that there's any study proving this works. Um, you don't have to prove something works in order to sell it unless it's like a medication and it's not. But, you know, you, you could test this. You know, maybe you could do your honors research on this. You know, put a, 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 it's odorless, so, so it's easy to, to control for it. Um, and, uh, you know, you could compare trustworthiness ratings of people who are wearing it and people who are not wearing it that would that be quite interesting and quite fun um, i also found um these sexual attraction pheromones online and this one here is is for for women to attract men and this one is for men to attract women and i think to get maybe more respect from from other men but what I learned in when I was looking these up was apparently um, it's hard to find odorless uh, human pheromones because um, they smell really bad. Apparently, like copulins smell like like ass. And so they, they require a cover scent. So there's a, a perfume that's covering it. And... So that contradicts what the textbook says about them being odorless. Apparently, they smell really bad. So let's look at the ingredients here. On uh, on this is the women's one. It's called uh, it's called Mistress. Uh, pheromone content is it's copulins. Uh, copulins are something that women release when they are ovulating. Um, Vomeroferin. I don't even know what that is. Estra tetraniol. Uh, whatever. And and then. Um, Vaginal secretions, vaginal allopathic acids. And, and I wonder, you know, where do they get those from? You know, are they human? I know that these allop um, allopathic acids were first detected in, in rhesus monkeys, but did, did they get them from the monkeys? Like, will this attract men or other monkeys? And what's in, in the male one? What did they say? They said, oh, it's hard for me to, to, to read this. The resolution is poor. The Alpha 7 formula contains both the confidence booster and drosterone and the classic alpha male sex pheromone androstenone. And they argue that adding androsterone uh, gives it a higher uh, success rate because um, it, it's some kind of a, a social pheromone, they say. And, and that balances out the sometimes agitating or intimidating effects of that um, sort of alpha male pheromone. So um, I don't know if these if these work or not. There there is some research on the subject with, with mixed results, but I can tell you that reading the Amazon reviews is is a lot of fun. All right. Then we also have a, a sense of our own body right, of, of what it's doing and, and where it is. And so we have a sense of, of touch and, and of pain, or they're, they're not quite the same thing. We have a kinesthetic sense, like you, you know, you can feel the position of your body right now. And we also have a vestibular sense that accounts for your equilibrium and balance. And we're not really very aware of our vestibular sense. Um, you, you'll be suddenly aware of it if you lose your balance and then you'll you'll correct it. Okay, so let's first cover the uh, somatosensory system. So this system responds to stimuli that like are applied to your skin. And, and they also respond to, to the temperature and to, to damage. And it involves so specialized nerve endings in the skin um, and, and then and free nerve endings as well. Let's go and, and talk about the different types of receptors. So mechanoreceptors um, 
sense stimuli because there's actually like a physical deformation of, of their plasma membrane that's associated with, with pressure and, and with touch, like with pushing and with pulling, with, with stretching, with, with vibration. Okay, that's how they detect it because through the physical deformation of their plasma membrane by the stimulus. Thermoreceptors um, detect temperature. Right? They, they code absolute and relative changes in temperature, and, and they work within a, the, the range of, of innocuous temperatures. There's a there's a fun experiment about uh, perception of temperature where you put like your hand in in a bowl of cold water and another hand in a bowl of, of hot water until you you adapt and you get used to it and then if you switch hands it, it feels quite shocking. Um, chemoreceptors detect individual chemicals and so sometimes something feels like it is burning you. Okay, that's your chemoreceptors being activated. Nociceptors respond to damaging stimuli. They, they send a signal that, that is about threat. And that gets your attention so you can focus on the part of your body that is probably or possibly being, being damaged so that you can do something about it. Okay, and then... Your brain produces a perception of pain. Remember we talked about how color isn't really out there in the real world, your, your brain kind of makes it up. Same thing with pain. And that's one of the reasons why pain is so subject to expectations, uh, to, to distraction, um, to placebos. So some folks are, are more sensitive to pain than others. We talk about uh, pain thresholds. It's interesting that sometimes we, we don't feel pain. Like sometimes something could or should be hurting and, and we don't notice it. And one reason could be attention, right? The, the, the point of pain is to, to get your attention on, onto the part of your body that's being harmed. And if your attention is somewhere else, you might not notice, okay, if it doesn't get your attention. And uh, the, the gate control model of, of pain argues that neural mechanisms in the spinal cord, cord regulate the conscious awareness of pain. Okay, so there's a, a pain signal that gets sent through your, your nerve fibers. But in, in the spine, an, an inhibitory neuron, and one of the interneurons in, in your spine could say, no, not, not sending that, that message up to the brain. Your kinesthetic sense helps you you know, keep track of, of where you are, right? And, and to move efficiently. And it's based on, uh, so you have stretch receptors in, in your muscles. You, you can feel your, your muscle stretching, right? It feels pretty good, actually. Um, and there's also force detectors. So you can feel when, when you're exerting force. Your vestibular sense is your sense of, of equilibrium, of, of balance, and it's what helps you balance as you move around, which you're doing all the time without uh, being aware of it. But And it has to do with um, fluid-filled parts of your ear called the semicircular canals. They're associated with balance. And Though your awareness of it, it, usually you're not aware of it, you'll certainly become aware of it if you were to, to say slip. Then you'd be very aware of it. There is a discipline or a subdiscipline of psychology called human factors, and it's associated with um, industrial organizational psychology. And it's about optimizing 
technology to better suit our sensory and perceptual capabilities. And this started with um, that during the Second World War, um, psychologists were looking to help um, help pilots right to avoid accidents because if uh, you know a pilot has an accident, the the consequences of that are are very great. And so you want to save your people and and you in a war effort, you definitely want to keep your pilots in the air. And so they started thinking about, well, you know, where are the controls and and the gadgets and and where should they be so that you notice them and that you don't get um, distracted by by the wrong thing. Um, and, and so there's a lot of thought and and planning goes goes into the way that a, a cockpit is designed. Um, human factors can also is also used to support productivity. So I don't know if you've ever had a, a job at McDonald's. Uh, a lot of thought has gone into you know where the cash register is related to like where, where the drink fountain, and then there's the burger shoot because the time to fill an order depends on all those movements and you want to keep things you you want to structure the the work environment so that the person is moving as efficiently as possible like imagine if you know every time they they rang in an order they had to you know walk across um to to get the fries and then like walk over to get the drinks and so you might want to to minimize that by thinking about where things are are placed. So we've discussed the senses in in isolation, but your brain actually has to pull all of that together. Okay, you. We attend to multiple senses at once, right? So I'm, I can hear my voice, and at the same time, I can feel the desk in front of me, and I can see my my laptop screen. There, there are two major types of, of processing of ways we process information. There's bottom up processing that's based on our what we're sensing, and then there's top-down processing that starts with with beliefs and and expectations. So um, and, and they they kind of work together to influence our final perception of what's going on around us. So part of what you perceive is directly from your you know sense information from your sensory receptors and, and part of it is what you're expecting and what what you think and what you've learned because your your brain can can only pay can only process so much information and it, and it builds a picture out of more than just your your sensory information it also draws on your your beliefs and your expectations to put it all together so you can see there's there's a picture there and and it's a picture of a woman. Is that what you're all seeing? You might see a woman because I told you that's a woman. But what if I said that's a jazz player? And do you do you see it differently now? Okay, that shows the influence of, of top-down processing. If I tell it, say, that's a picture of a woman, you go look at it and, and you see a woman because I've cued you to do that and, and you're picking up the same picture that could also be a jazz player. Um, I see some uh, comments in the chat and one of them is uh, about human factors. And the, the question is, would it have been beneficial for a World War II fighter pilot's cockpit to, to be as simplistic as possible? Um, you have an assumption there that simpler is better. And I don't know that it always is. Like you'd want to do tests to see whether um, 
adding something, removing something, making it more noticeable is, is better or not. And it's wonderful that we have flight simulators uh, so you don't have to, to do that with, with actual accidents. So is simpler better? I don't know. But these are all, um, are, are all testable hypotheses. I had um, been planning to start the next lecture on this slide. I got through the previous slides quite quickly, but uh, since it's only 10.06, I will keep going. So if I tell you that there is a, um, that's a picture of a woman, or that, that this over here is a picture of, of an old woman, that gives you what we call a, a perceptual set. You have a, a readiness to perceive the stimulus in a certain way, okay, because of this, this kind of script. Um, something that we see in in research is called a, like a response set. If you're sometimes we respond in ways that are socially ex, um, socially expected. An example of that is one of the questions that um, I put on the midterm. And you'll remember I gave a question about uh, a research design, and I say that I'm going to do an experiment on the class. Uh, I want to know if um, studying has any effect on final grade. And, you know, I'll divide you into five groups. And, you know, in this group, you're not allowed to study. And in the other group, you can, you know, study two hours a week. And then in the, I think, the last group, uh, the highest, has the highest dose of, of studying. Maybe it was something like 10 or 20 hours a week. And my question then is like select the best response and and one of the options is to increase the experimental control and we can increase that control by um by blinding you know would it be better if i didn't know which group you're assigned to like yeah you know, only the teaching assistant knows that and most students will select that response rather than report to the study for being like obviously unethical because by that point you've read these chapters on on research methods and it's been kind of ground into you that more experimental control is is better for internal validity and so people just kind of i think people select the that option to increase the control rather than to report it because you've been you have a a response set that that's based on um, hearing, being taught that more control is better. But you know, if I had spent more time teaching about ethics, then then maybe you'd select the option to to report it. There is another uh, example here where um, you these shapes are, are the same, but you might perceive this as an H and, and this as an A, because then it's it's more meaningful. It looks like the bat. Actually, when I saw this, I immediately thought, I was thinking about uh, butylated hydroxytoluene, so I saw it as uh, BHT. Um, but we have a bias to perceive things in ways that make sense because they're meaningful because they because they fit somehow this is um a pretty famous um stimuli in uh, intro psychology class and depending on which way you look at it you can see this as as an old woman that the textbook calls the woman a witch i'm, I'm gonna flag that one for Misogyny. There's no reason to put that word into to the description. Um, old women are, uh, you know, it, it's it's sort of a devaluing almost of the of, of an aged woman, which I I don't care for anyway. But the the older woman can be seen as uh, from the side putting her her head down. So this would be her chin. That is her her lips. Here's her nose and these are her eyes and that those are her bangs and then she's wearing some kind of a scarf or 
um, you can see it as a young woman who has her her head turned over her shoulder. I don't know why they have a feather on on one, but but not the other. Maybe they made it easier to see. But it then this becomes this is her neck. That's a choker necklace. That's her jaw. This is her ear. You can just see a little bit of eyelash. You've probably all seen seen that one before. We perceive stimuli as consistent across conditions where the stimulus itself is actually changing. So um, what's being projected onto your retina um, is uh, a rectangle when you're looking straight onto the door. When the door opens, it's not rectangular anymore. You're, you're actually seeing a, a trapezoid, but you continue to perceive, to understand, to subjectively experience this um, as a a, a rectangle like you know that's not a, a trapezoid shape even though that's the sensory information that that is coming in um here is this we looked at this before when we were talking about color and these squares a and and b are actually the exact same shade of gray i find that amazing but you're interpreting this in a larger context where you Stepping back from it, you know that there's this checkerboard and that these are the, the gray squares and these are the white ones and that there's some object here that's, that's casting a shadow. So even though the A and the B squares are exactly the same shade, you're interpreting this one as white and, and this one as dark gray, even though they're the same. There are rules that we that govern how we perceive objects as wholes. Gestalt means means whole. So one of them is proximity. So we have a bias to perceive that there are three objects here. I mean, you don't have to see it that way. Right? You could say that they're there's different ways that, that you could, could group these arbitrarily, or you wouldn't, maybe you don't have to group them at all. But what most of us will do is group them into, into three. And we put them in a group based on proximity, right? These two lines are in group one because they are next to each other. You're not, we're not going to say, oh, okay, you know, this one is a group with, with this one on, on the other side. No, we don't do that. So that's the rule of proximity. Then there's similarity. So maybe you could say that there's, you know, two types of object here. Uh, there's the yellow lines and, and the red lines. And we'd uh, group them together based on, on the same color. Then there's um, continuity. When we see this cross, we implicitly assume that it's made out of um, two continuous lines placed on top of each other and, and not four separate lines that, that are just sort of pushed together. It's, it's almost like a more complicated thing to assume. That could be the case. Your brain um, will also kind of fill in the gaps. So we're, we're ready to perceive this as a circle, even though it's not, right? Because we, we can fill in, your brain just kind of fills in that, that information. And you're likely to perceive this as a, um, as a square. Um, sometimes we, we have a, a, we also have a bias to see things that are in the, the foreground first. So we have a sense that um, that something um, is is an object in, in the foreground and that the rest is is background. And this is called the figure ground illusion. So you could see this as a like a candelabra uh, or you could see it as uh, two faces that that are looking 
at each other. Um, we're also, in terms of grouping, you're, what you're most likely to do when you see these um, triangles here is, is to group them together as shown, as shown over here. If this is one group, and and this is another and that's based on symmetry right you're not um breaking them up to groups like that right that would be asymmetrical so we we perceive symmetric things as as wholes um visual perception is uh quite interesting uh when we were learning about opponent processes in colors do you remember that that lilac chaser illusion where there's um these purple dots that just disappear and and but one of them disappears followed by another one so this one disappears then that one then the other one and it actually creates an illusion of movement and that is called the phi phenomenon and and um signs use that like sometimes you get these like signs that are like a flashing arrow that say go this way and so to determine motion, the brain compares visual frames like of, of what what it just remember what just happened versus what's happening now. And, and that same principle applies to, to movies. So when you watch a movie, you're actually seeing stills, but there's many, many frames per second, and that creates the the appearance or, or the illusion of movement. This is a, a fun illusion that's in your textbook. Um, you can look at the the square, and if you move the page backwards and forwards, it will look like they um, that they're rotating when when they're really not. So um, we are are predators that have uh, forward facing eyes that have um, slightly different images of the world and and you know that if you put your thumb in front of your your eyes and then close one eye and then close the other one and it looks like your thumb is jumping from one side to another so your brain pulls that information together into to one picture unlike a mouse who sees different images from from different eyes and there are cues that tell us how far away something is and and that's important especially if you're going to be a, a predator that needs to to catch things right um and so one of them is is relative size we um things that we see things that are closer to us look bigger and we call these um monocular cues because if you only had one eye you would still be able to perceive depth based on those cues. Now, the one is texture gradient. If something's up close, you can see the texture on it. And then as it gets further away, that, that blurs out. Interposition means that something that uh, seems to cover something else is further away. So this hand is closer to the, the camera, and this one's further away. And you know that because this hand is in front of the other one. That's interposition. Uh, linear perspective, for for some strange reason, as uh, things uh, as if you had two parallel lines, as as they get further into the distance, they appear to converge, right? Like in into a vanishing point. Height and plane um, refers to the fact that things that are nearer to us look kind of lower down on on a frame in the frame and things that are, are further away uh, like say that the mountains in a scene are they're positioned higher up in in the picture and then of course like shadow like a shadow falling on something tells you where it is um then there are cues that require both eyes and those are like a disparity and convergence and i see that it is now 10 20 and we will pick up on this next class so thank you for your attention and i'll stop the recording here